Resilience, the next stairway to heaven, I titled my presentation. And I had two thoughts in my mind. The first was, uh, stairways and ladders are very popular in uh, safety uh, these days, especially in the Netherlands. And I'm not going to talk about culture ladders now, but um, maybe uh, resilience is the next candidate uh, for this to happen. And then there's of course, uh, you recognize the picture? It's the inner cover of Led Zeppelin uh, album, which contains the classical uh, song, Stairway to Heaven. And the lyric was actually quite fitting, I thought, for what I had in mind to do, uh, because there's a lady who's sure all that glitters is gold and she's going to buy a stairway to heaven. And is resilient <coughs> to do this for us? Was what I thought, let's explore, let's reflect a bit and see where we end. A bit about myself, just a quick introduction uh, to give you some background and context where I come from, because resilience is everywhere in a lot of uh, 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 different uh, uh, areas of study and uh, well I'm an engineer came into uh, safety quite early in my career actually it started my career and that is where I come from traditional safety management I studied safety after I became a mechanical engineer I worked mainly in technical environments for many many years railways you see some of the places I've been I started with, uh, with uh, occupational safety, expanded to transport safety, system safety, safety management, all that kind of stuff in the Netherlands, then in Norway. And currently I am working in the police. I made a switch, I didn't like the realization and uh, found out police is quite a fascinating uh, area to work as a safety professional. Firstly, you have to think entirely new because they have completely other, uh, shall I say, attitude uh, with regard to risk. Um, there's a saying uh, where everybody runs from, police and fire uh, uh, brigades, they run to the place. So they actually uh, have to look for the risk. That's a new way of thinking. Where, where, where do you stop? What is a LARP in, in that uh, setting? Not going to discuss it, but fascinating area. And I, I thought also from a uh, resilience perspective, um, policemen, they are faced with extreme amounts of uncertainty. If they get a call, there is noise at the neighbors. What does that mean? Is the TV a bit high? Are they having a party? Is there a guy beating up his wife? What is it? And anyway, if they uh, ring the bell and say, hello, your neighbor's complained, they're probably not going to be met with a lot of enthusiasm. But they handle it quite well. So for me, the, the police was, was an area of well, resilience. Let me find out. And I'm still in the process of finding out. Um, apart from that, uh, Quite professionally uh, active, I uh, am uh, doing a lot for the Dutch Society of Safety Science in their uh, quarterly magazine and uh, stuff. I've written some books, and now uh, the sponsor part. Tada! I have a new one. Came out last week. <coughs> Highly recommended, of course, on safety measurement. And I'm also, and that's to my surprise, it was uh, advertised in a, in a program that I uh, connected to the University of Lent. And I am, but it's only a side job. But I, I, I have the, the, the honor to be involved in the Human Factors and System Safety program at Lund University. And um, we, the program is quite uh, in the forefront of uh, the whole resilience uh, stuff. Uh, it was founded by Sidney Decker uh, a couple of years ago, and there is this, uh, this uh, strong tendency to uh, stress the resilience engineering uh, uh, themes. But, and that's one thing I am very excited about, uh, we uh, 
wants to be critical of everything. And even a resilient engineering, which is the foundation where the, the whole uh, program started, is treated in a critical way. What are the pros, what are the cons, what are the pitfalls, and so on. And we encourage our students to, to look that way. And part of my uh, presentation today is based on an essay I wrote while I was in the program. <laughs> Six reasons to be careful about uh, resilience. <coughs> uh, fun trivia, by the way. We have a motto. It's Latin. I'm not going to try it. But it means prepared for both. When the University of Land was uh, created in the uh, 1600s, uh, the aim was uh, to Swedify the, the area because they had just conquered it from the Danish and they were to educate people but also to defend. So there was already resilience in its basis. <coughs> and I'm quite interested in uh, history, safety history, so let me take you there a few moments. Um, and this is one possible uh, history of uh, resilience engineering, resilience in safety. <coughs> and it starts as most good things in safety, it starts with a bang. A bang, and I think seven people, many million or billions of dollars lost, the end of a program, the Columbia a disaster. I don't know, are you all familiar with what happened at that uh, uh, <coughs> There's the. I, I don't have a pointer, so you have this tank that was a big part of foam that came off from the tank. It hit the wing, and on the re-entry of the uh, <coughs> of atmosphere, uh, it turned out that the integrity uh, had weakened so much that uh, that the space shuttle burned up. Astronauts died, and this was the end of practical end of the. Uh, Space shuttle program <coughs> in 2004, and there came, of course, a congressional uh, investigation. There was a, a big board, Columbia Accident Incident Board, and one of the people that uh, testified for the board was part of the investigation was David Woods, and in his <coughs> testimony to uh, to the to the Accident Board, uh, he told about uh, the future. Uh, how NASA uh, could better uh, manage safety. And there he mentioned uh, resilience engineering because uh, you, they were in a situation where uh, the defenses and, and the procedures had eroded over several years, partly thanks to a faster, better, cheaper uh, program. And uh, in order to cope with that, you didn't only uh, couldn't only rely on the traditional uh, ways of uh, managing safety, you also needed resilience <coughs> to adapt to the changes. So that was one start, and it got a follow-up the next year, when Woods and some like-minded people met in Sweden. And there's a picture there, and you see probably some familiar names for you who have read some uh, safety literature. Eric Holnagel is there, Sidney Decker is there, um, yeah, and a couple of other less known people. Uh, missing from the picture is uh, Nancy Levinson, who was also uh, quite uh, involved and also in the, in the Columbia uh, investigation. And that, uh, is, that meeting is probably seen as the official start for resilience engineering. Um, also missing from the picture, if you want to tell an other uh, history, is uh, Jens Rasmussen. At the time he had uh, uh, re uh, retired, and, but if you go back to another disaster, Three Mile Island, the work Jens Rasmussen started from then on, and the whole, uh, let me say, uh, cognitive uh, uh, system engineering, where Woods and Holnagel were uh, students of uh, uh, Rasmussen is actually the, the real backbone uh, for resilience engineer. Then, 2006, came a book. It's pictured there. It's uh, the first uh, uh, big resilience engineering book. 
I think from then on it became uh, well a bit of a snowball, more people attached to it, other books came, and uh, these days we have a quite thriving uh, community within safety science. And we have also side branches. Have you heard about safety too? Safety differently? Hop? It's all offsprings from uh, resilience engineering. And like anything new, we can of course ask the question, do we really need this? And the fun thing is, in that resilience book, the first book, there is this a chapter by Andrew Hale and what's he called? Tom Heyer? Yeah. yeah, Hale and Heyer. Reference there. And they ask that very question. Do we really re need resilience? Isn't this just risk management? And if it isn't, uh, is resilience uh, uh, the best way or the advised way? And when is it? They don't really answer it, but I think it's quite fascinating that uh, a movement has the ability to ask right from the start, <coughs> is there actually anyone waiting for this, and should they be waiting for this? And a few years later, or over time, there came more critique, and quite serious critique. This is uh, Andrew Hopkins, professor from Australia who wrote a fascinating uh, paper on uh, safety science and the state of safety science and one of the uh, fields of, or the domains or the, the schools in safety science that he addresses is a resilience engineering and he is quite harsh I think he says this is just HRO, high reliability uh, theory brushed up, new names and this is really nothing new Okay, that's possible. And then he goes on, and, and I think here he becomes quite really harsh and says this is uh, something that is mainly uh, initiated by people who want to drive their own agenda to become famous, to sell their books, to... Well, it's mostly for them. And I think we can find some support for that point of view. If you, for example, uh, take uh, Eric Holnagel's uh, Safety 1, Safety 2 book, the fourth, anyone read it here? Yeah, you, you should read it, but I would rather recommend read the uh, Eurocontrol uh, white paper. It's free, it's slimmer, it's more positive. But uh, in his book, Holnagel uh, actually trashes the four, first four uh, chapters, he really trashes all the uh, traditional safety approaches. And after reading that, uh, and I was a big Holnagel fan at the time, still, uh, I read it and I thought, what are you saying? <laughs> Have we been idiots for 90 years? Have we been all wrong? And then in chapter 5 it suddenly uh, turns. So that's one of the things where I think uh, Hopkins has a point. People uh, use language and discourse and paint the other kinds of safety or other approaches to risk management as, as bad and obsolete and, and all that stuff to, to get attention, positive or negative, for their own uh, uh, writings. But he, uh, he suggests it's a, it's a fashion. And is it? <coughs> I, I could actually uh, relate very much to Hopkins' uh, writing because after I read the, the, the book uh, uh, the first time, which was in 2007, I guess, I had to hear Paul Nargel on a couple of conferences and I was quite enthusiastic. Wow, uh, new approach, learning from positive stuff was one of his messages where he had this big circle green and, and small red stripe where he said that uh, we are focusing only on this and we are ignoring the, the whole mass of learning opportunities, learning from normal uh, operation. I thought, wow, that, that's fantastic, let me get that book. And then I read it and I thought, this is uh, what we've been doing for years, ages, decades. So that, that was my initial mm, feeling. 
Um, over the years I've read some more and I discovered this fascinating uh, book. I was really attracted by the, by the title. I thought, Searching for Safety. That's interesting. What, what, what does uh, this, uh, this uh, Rodowski uh, uh, write, write about? And it turns out this is the book that introduced resilience into uh, safety. He has a fascinating discussion where he uh, takes uh, the, the, say, more traditional uh, safety approaches of prevention and all that, and the, the, the more organic approach, uh, resilience. And he compares those two, and he does it uh, with, with ecological examples, uh, animals and, and plants, and also uh, sociological uh, systems. And he draws some really interesting conclusions. He doesn't say it's either this or that, but as mostly in safety, uh, the, the answer is it depends. Fascinating. And what is interesting, this is the book that introduced, as far as I know, uh, resilience into uh, uh, safety. It is not referenced or mentioned in the other book, which we commonly see as the start. And just continuing some critique, here's Holnagel. Maybe you've seen uh, the picture or heard the term, Four Cornerstones of Resilience. Uh, he introduced it in the second book and changed it over time a bit. And it looks quite good, because what are the elements of resilience? Learning, responding, monitoring, anticipating. Not in that order. But if we are a bit critical doesn't it awfully sound like plan, do, study, act? Just rearranged and drawn with, uh, with uh, uh, hexagons instead of uh, a circle. Hmm. So how new is all this? And is it really worth it? There are some people who have responded to it. And I'm not going to, to do this very thoroughly. But some uh, good uh, discussions are found in recent papers about that actually compare HRO, high, resili uh, high reliability, and resilience engineering. Uh, John Christophe Lecos and, and a Norwegian uh, gang of, uh, of uh, academics uh, on the lead of uh, Holvik, uh, they did a really uh, good job and. Uh, I could uh, recommend reading the whole book uh, paper if you're really interested because they take it from a practical uh, point of view. They say uh, all these methods they have to serve us in the, in, the, in the practice and what do they add and what is the value there instead of focusing uh, on uh, well it's just repackaging and, and stuff like that. And these papers conclude um, yes there are a lot of similarities but there are also uh, a lot of differences and uh, uh, the main difference is not in the answers they give but in the question they ask because they come from different schools they have different backgrounds and because of that uh, the, the two schools <coughs> HRO, Resilience Engineering they look differently at the situation and that is a value that you have the possibility to use two different sets of glasses, get more perspectives, and they can add up to each other. And then, personally speaking, I think we really need resilience. And it goes back uh, to, uh, to uh, Woods's uh, uh, testimony before this uh, excellent board. And I can relate it to my, my own uh, everyday work uh, in the police. We cannot uh, prevent everything from happening. We handle just a lot of stuff as it happens. And we have to prepare for that, be prepared for that. And we deal with, uh, with the limitations of, uh, of a traditional uh, uh, risk and safety management. Our knowledge is re uh, restricted, we have only so many resources, um, we know only the things we know, and so on, and so on. 
And therefore, we have to be able to adapt and react in a safe way. And one thing I really like about resilience uh, uh, thinking is that it's much more positive. Traditional uh, risk management tends to be very defensive. We build barriers. We try to reduce the risk. It's typically not risk-taking. Resilience uh, approach is much more risk-taking. And I have a fascinating uh, quote from very long ago. I think it's 1921. That this uh, uh, chap uh, discussed uh, the early safety movement, which was very much about guarding machines, imposing rules, safe work, and so on. And he said, that is not what safety is about. It's a part of safety. But what safety really should be about is adventure. Because everything that's interesting in life and that's fun, it's about adventure. And safety is an enabler for us to have better adventures. I think that's a fascinating approach. And he doesn't use the word resilience. This is resilience uh, engineer or resilience in a nutshell, I think. Okay, so I am really positive about, uh, despite all the critique and so on, I am positive and I uh, propagate uh, uh, resilience. Still I have some uh, uh, thoughts and I see some uh, pitfalls. Here are some pictures that I uh, took during my uh, last but one uh, visit at the airport. I tend to swipe through the, through the uh, Bookstore and Gardamon, Oslo Airport has still a quite decent bookshop. And just randomly uh, I checked the psychological and the uh, management uh, section there. And of course you find resilience books. I think for me it, it contributes to the inflation of the term because you see it everywhere. Uh, especially self-help books, a lot of psychology where it's one of the origins of the term, I think. So, uh, uh, no criticism there. And then it spread out to a lot of other uh, areas. And that has a danger. Because people become so familiar with the term that they just throw it around like we do with culture uh, these days. Because everybody speaks about culture and, well, who knows what it is. So when we speak about uh, resilience, what do we mean? And now I'm talking within safety or risk management, not psychology or engineering, which also has uh, resilience. Sometimes it seems it's just another term for risk management or uh, safety. It's just become a synonym. And is that right? I'm not sure. Uh, David Woods, the guy from Colombia, if you remember. Um, he came at some point and said uh, uh, there is an overuse of the term. And he proposes uh, four different concepts. And that's quite nice because it gives some structure to the, to the discussion. What kind of resilience are you talking about? The first one he mentions is uh, the, the typical, uh, what's his name, from Alst. He mentioned it, it's, it's the bouncing back. Something happens and then you return to, uh, to normal. In the old days, before resilience was a thing, when I started working in the early 90s, we had, we had a business continuity plan. If the main storage facility, if the computer ran down, we had a plan, and uh, within hours they were up and running again, and we could do business. That's kind of resilience. Then you have the, the, the second one, uh, that's robustness. You just built big, can't say the word, barriers, and you, you make sure that the thing uh, uh, remains stable. You just built so many uh, uh, barriers that you're super robust. There's of course a limit to that, financial, practical, and so on, but it's, it's one our way. Um, Woods doesn't think a lot of these two options, by the way. He is more about the other two, with some more fancy names. 
Um, the first he calls uh, graceful extendability, which is a play on graceful uh, degradation. It's that, that uh, uh, an item uh, breaks down slowly so you can react. He says an organization or a system can extend if there's applied stress. And it does it slowly and controlled. And after a while it can return. That's one. Uh, that's his reactive uh, way of looking at uh, resilience. And then there's the, the really uh, proactive uh, way, the, the final one, he calls it sustained adaptability, which is you react on, on situations and you change. You just change the whole time in order to, to handle uh, the situation. So there's actually a constant unstableness, you could say, <coughs> but it enables you to survive and handle stuff. I think that's four useful ways of thinking about it. Uh, then came Taleb, of course. Nice book, anti-fragile, I like it a lot. But he muddies the water again. Because he has his three, uh, shall I say, phases or kinds. There are fragile things, you apply stress to them, they break like an egg. Uh, there are the, the robust things. You apply, apply stress to them and they stay the same, to a limit, like a rock. And then uh, you have the, the stuff that actually improves on the, uh, on the stress, like a bouncing ball. bouncing ball doesn't anything, but if you apply stress to it, it becomes fun. Um, and then he does something very weird, because in my head was, oh, uh, fragility, and the fragility that's uh, about resilience, then he says, it's not resilience. Which was, for me, like, what the fuck? <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> Haven't you read anything from your colleagues? And no, I don't think he has, because that's not what he does. So, let's just thank him for enriching the language with yet another concept. Um, <clears throat> One of the problems of this overuse of the word is that it becomes a buzzword, something that is really uh, uh, becomes a fashion. These days it's easy, I don't know, I don't sell it, but it's probably easy to sell a resilience uh, to, to someone and not something old fashioned. ISO 9000 isn't the thing anymore. Um, and that means that, that probably uh, people are going uh, to want their share of the cake. People have something to sell and think, you know, we just stick, uh, put a label uh, uh, resilience on it and it sounds trendy, it's in. And we brush up, we use some of the language and uh, there we go. Then there's of course the other side. Very necessary, there are all these uh, professors writing books and articles and they are living in their own uh, ivory towers. But of course these concepts have to mean something for the people on the, in the sharp end. <coughs> so these professors, and praise to Holnagel uh, uh, who does a lot of that, uh, try to operatize these, uh, these concepts. And then they come up with stuff like, uh, this is a picture of the uh, resilience <coughs> assessment grid that the whole article they came up with. And I think, okay, that's a good idea, but I also see the problem. Because it is very easy to adapt this ID into some kind of a standard and then make a resilience a maturity ladder out of it where you have different levels of resilience uh, and maturity. Certified people have resilience black belt uh, consultants and, uh, well, big business. And there are several other of these movements and I think we, we need them. At the same time I see them as a problem because resilience games, I, I've heard they're great or there are some great examples. Um, that can also be uh, just a fad and something we do 
Now we've last year we had a, a safety culture day with a safety culture game. Let's this year have a resilient uh, uh, game because uh, that's a new thing. And then, well, everybody thinks we are doing some great stuff. And all this overuse and buzzwordiness leads to can lead to very shallow understanding because people read something in a Harvard Business Review. Three pages, nice and compact, get some of the words and think, okay, now I know about the resilience, let's get to work. And may lead them to believe, I know actually some safety people who think safety too, resilience is all there is. All the old stuff, ha, bow ties, my god, that's, that's their approach. Which isn't what the resilience people actually write. If you're past those four chapters of Holmar uh, hammering down on the old ways, he opens chapter five, I think, and says, "We all we need all this old stuff. It has helped us get where we are, and we still need it. But we also need other stuff to go get further than where we are now." You can also think, uh, well, resilience, we don't need preparation anymore, we just improvise our way. Um, and of course, there's always the danger of, uh, wow, we've seen uh, uh, this working in another company, let's just copy what they do, because it was a success for them. And then, with the danger of not understanding what they did, why they did, how they did it, and we copy just the rituals the systems, the tools, and before you know it, we, we, we have a neighboring department uh, in our office. Uh, they have this big whiteboard where they write their goals and their actions and their problems. And on Monday morning, they stand around the board and have a, a quarter of a stand up meeting. And I think they're doing lean, which is, well, one of the things. I fear can happen with resilience. In order to get away of this shallow understanding, uh, there are some things I would suggest we can reflect on um, to, to, to get a better use of, uh, of uh, resilience. One of the things to reflect on is where do we think resilience comes from? Uh, does it come from engineering? that we build our systems, our organization, that we build our people in a way to get more resilient. Resilience engineering, the term which is uh, commonly used in safety, does suggest that. However, if you look at, uh, uh, really read uh, the, the stuff, uh, they all agree on uh, resilience is an emergent property of a system. Resilience uh, comes from complexity, comes from uh, often unexpected uh, interactions between the parts. And if it is emergent, you have a problem engineering it, because you don't understand everything that happens, you do don't have an overview of all the parts and all the interactions and all the possibilities, so it's really hard to engineer. But you can try to cultivate, you can test out stuff and maybe nudge the system and maybe have some enablers and stuff. So, you can also phrase that the question uh, is resilience engineering something we have? Which this, this resilience assessment grid might suggest. You take a picture of your organization and you look how good are you doing on resilience? This is what we have. This is it enough? Or is resilience actually something you do? Activity. Something you are busy with. The second uh, important question to ask is what is our unit of analysis? And uh, ATS TV uh, turns out to be a great inspiration for resilience. I was indoctrinated uh, by resilience uh, uh, when I was uh, much younger. And uh, the two 
types of resilient of a, a unit of analysis are here on the table. There's the individual MacGyver. You dump him in some site. And I recall that the first episode, I think it was, where you had a chocolate bar and welded some kind of chemical uh, a reactor. Uh, well, I remember that 30 years ago or something. I think fascinating. That's individual resilience. He is a crafty guy and he fixes thing with all the litter he finds uh, around or he has on him. And he has a Swiss army knife, of course. Then the other uh, side. And I'm stretching the, the concept a bit here. We could say that uh, the unit of analysis is the organization, it's a team, it's a unit, it's a system. Uh, there we have four very different guys. A uh, muscle man, an idiot, some kind of a boss, but I, I really don't remember what his contribution was. Except smiling and saying I love it when a plan gets together. And, and a fixer, and in some way they ended always up in some basement uh, where they found a couple of cardboard boxes and built a tank <laughs> that shot oranges at the bad guys and they saved the day. You know this was real. <laughs> I thought it was a documentary. <laughs> I always wondered why it wasn't on History Channel. <laughs> anyway, I, I think in, in, in a funny way, they are a, a type of uh, uh, where, you, where you see the, the resilience in a team. They have different contributions uh, uh, made. And, and where are we? And uh, these thoughts about where are we, what are our approaches, emergence, engineering, a bit of both, individual, system, unit, organization. Um, they uh, can help us to avoid some traps. The first one follows a bit of the uh, unit versus individual. Um, the, the, the reductionist uh, trap. Often uh, we think that we can, uh, uh, from uh, taking the, the parts of the system, extrapolate that to the system, or vice versa. But <coughs> For emergent properties, for complexity, um, you cannot uh, take uh, uh, the, the properties of one and say it applies to the other. It's just not the case. You can't automatically uh, connect those two. So this is one prep. Uh, there's a great chapter about uh, resilience engineering, both in a historical perspective and uh, also uh, uh, a couple of traps in a used book uh, by, uh, by Sidney Decker chapter written by uh, Johan Bergström and Decker although I think it's mostly Bergström and reductionism is one of the things that I uh, discuss so watch out for that the other one is, is uh, I would call it the dark side of resilience it's where we uh, make resilience a normative thing. And if you look at a, a number of discourses around resilience, especially in governance, but maybe also in safety, and it's coming also in safety regulations, uh, the, the regulations about uh, uh, crew resource management, for example, in aviation, uh, they say something about adaptivity which means that suddenly resilience is something that uh, is required by uh, regulations. And how are you going to deal with that? And what if you make resilience about uh, the sharp end? About the, the well, actually we sh uh, resilience should some be something that, that helps the guy in the sharp end because the, the, the whole organization or the system is built such that the, the people in the sharp end can handle a situation. But what if you turn it towards him and say, you should have been much more resilient, resilient. you should have handled this, you should have done such or so. Then it isn't about resilience anymore, I think. It's just human error in disguise and blame and, well, 
all that. A uh, great video clip. I think you get the the slides afterward. Watch it. It's it's eight minutes. Fantastic discussion by uh, Johan Bergström. Um, another thing. I think we all have the, the uh, natural view that resilience is a good thing. But is that really so? And is also something that is resilient, is that good? No, because firstly because uh, many very, very bad things are super resilient. Viruses and uh, gangster organization uh, organized the crime. Uh, Sidney Decker in his book Drift into uh, Disaster. Failure. Hmm? Failure. Drift into Failure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, describes the case of uh, how uh, uh, narcotic uh, smugglers adapt to the changing uh, uh, situations. They are super resilient. They find new ways, new ways, new ways, and they're always ahead of uh, uh, police. So, uh, resilient doesn't mean good. And then there is also the problem, uh, how much resilient is actually good for you? The picture there, that's Paracelsus, and he said something uh, rather famous, or maybe he hasn't said it, but it's always attributed to him. He says, everything is poison, it's only dose. Water is not perceived as poisonous, but drink 900 liters and you're quite dead, to say it mildly. And, and kitchen salt, you don't even need that much to, uh, to die. So, the same applies to resilience. Take resilience too long and it becomes only uh, uh, well, fumbling and modeling and uh, adapting and, well, it might tip over in recklessness, actually. paper I referenced here uh, it makes some really good uh, reflections, uh, but it's, uh, it's not only about uh, improvisation. Improvisation is a part of it, but resilience uh, is also about structure. And you need also to be aware of uh, the side effects of your improvisation, because improvisation may be uh, great on the short term, but what does it do on the long term? How does it your, affect your uh, system? And then there's the thing, everything breaks eventually. That's Taleb, of course. Just one, uh, one case before I round up. Uh, it's a rather uh, well, infamous uh, case, at least in, in Sweden. I don't know if you've heard about it. There was this, uh, this uh, hospital that were overcrowded. Uh, uh, they had people uh, out in the hallways lying on a bed, and uh, the, the system, I think the, the warning system, went down. And what they did, they went to a local shop, they bought pots and pans and stuff, handed them out and said, if you need help, clang them together. Which is super creative. Yeah. The question is, is this the resilience you want? This is definitely resilient, resilient people, but is this also about the resilient system? I think not. And uh, you have to ask uh, where do you want to be? Do you just want to rely on people being creative to save the day for you? Or do you actually create a system that well, makes it, uh, enables them to, uh, to deal with everyday problems in a decent way? So, I started, is the next stairway to heaven? Probably not. However, I think we need it. We should embrace resilient approaches, explore them, and keep uh, possible uh, uh, pitfalls in the back of our minds when we, uh, when we implement them. And we, we need both, and it's, it's in that uh, Amal Berti uh, paper, that uh, says uh, it's not just improvisation, it's also preparation, it's also uh, doing things in a structured way. Um, we need them both. We need to prepare, we need to uh, prevent what we can deal with everything, and then we have to be prepared for the rest. 
I think they, when, I, when I prepared it, I, we had this little discussion uh, online. I think this sums it up quite nicely, uh, Roland Barker, who says it's not the holy grail, but you need a healthy mix of different approaches and a lot of curiosity. And uh, it's not the stairway, but it might just extend your life a bit, uh, so you don't need to go to heaven yet. <laughs> Thank you! I don't know if there were, uh, was room for any question. Yes, there was one. If you Google uh, Uber Control White Paper Safety 2, you should get the download link. It's, it's a 10 uh, page brochure. It's very readable. It has even some good examples. Highly recommend it. About your warning regarding not make resilience something that's sort of shapeable in a checklist. Yeah. You seem to be cautious about making it too formal, too strict, too somehow accountable. Is it, is it, warning, is, is it more of a warning about? Don't make it too formal, or...? No. Um, I think checklists uh, can and will... Actually, checklists help to become more resilient. Uh, we, we have seen that from, from healthcare where, and, and uh, aviation, uh, where checklists are used uh, to great benefit. Um, I think uh, when it comes to... to, to say risk management and so on. Uh, one danger is that uh, the uh, useful tool checklist to see where are you, what are you strong and your weak sides and so on becomes an end in itself. And, and, and then you're on the, on the wrong way and that's, well, the safety culture ladder for example, I don't know if you know it. Uh, the thought behind it I think is good. But use it as a as a, a, a start of a discussion, and then all these uh, the, this resilience uh, assessment grid. I, I haven't tested it. Uh, I don't know it too well. I think it's a great way to start a discussion uh, about. Okay, we've identified some areas. This is strong. This is weak. What should we do more of? What should we do less of? And what does it mean for the rest of the system? So I think they are great tools. And we should watch that they don't uh, end up uh, being uh, ends in themselves. Because we've seen that also in, in other areas such as education where children are taught to the test. Yeah. If I understand correctly your that's message, that's exactly, that's, my that's point. exactly your warning against yes. Yes. going. Because what my understanding of, of the whole well, risk management resilience preparation is that you are prepared for a number of risks that you can assess, but there are always things that you don't know that they come, can come. And then the danger of over and focus on only control of risks uh, sort of builds in blind, blind, blind spots. In, in yes, exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful.